The one call you will never get from me as a mastering engineer is, hey, can you send me a version with the limiter off? Especially if it's coming from a, if it's a good mix coming from a good mixer. My suggestion to a client, if, if a mastering engineer calls you and asks you for a version with the limiter off and you know you have a solid mix, you should tell them, I'm sorry, I'm going to find another mastering engineer. <laughs> Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by Sonarworks, helping you get the most out of your mixes by correcting the sound of the speakers and headphones in your studio so you get your mix right the first time. Are you sick of doing multiple mixes and still you can't get the low end right? How would it feel to have badass bass the first time? Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Are you ready to rock the perfect mix? This episode is sponsored by OWC. Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Howdy, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Pete Lyman a Grammy-nominated mastering engineer based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and owner of Infrasonic Mastering, an audio and vinyl mastering studio with locations in Echo Park, California, and Nashville, Tennessee. Pete has mastered Grammy-nominated projects for Panic at the Disco, Weezer, and Grammy award-winning albums for Jason Isbell and Chris Stapleton. In 2016, he was recognized with a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year for Chris Stapleton's Traveler. Pete's music career began at age 14, playing bass in a number of bands in Boulder, Colorado, California's Bay Area, and Los Angeles. Over the years, he's shared the stage with a variety of bands, including My Bloody Valentine, The Mars Volta, and Seba Do. In 2004, Pete opened Infrasonic Sound, a 2,000-square-foot tracking studio in the northeast Los Angeles neighborhood of El Sereno. The studio was host to numerous bands, including The Mars Volta, Kenny Wayne Shepard, Beck, People Under the Stairs, and Liars. And in 2005, he added a mastering suite to the Infrasonic Complex, which became home to his 1956 Neumann AM32B cutting lathe. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, as he began to focus strictly on mastering, Pete and his studio partner, Jeff Ehrenberg, sold the El Sereno space and together opened a new custom-built facility at 11... 76, 1176, nice, West Sunset Boulevard in the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. In 2018, Pete opened his second studio facility, Infrasonic East in Nashville, Tennessee. Infrasonic East is now home to Pete Lyman's custom mastering suite and the Neumann Cutting Lathe, where he works with a diverse client roster from John Prine and Dirk's Dirks Bentley. How do I, I don't know how to it's say it. Dirks. Name. It's Dirks. Dirks yep. Bentley, right? Dirks Bentley to Fallout Boy and Halsey on projects of all sizes. So please welcome Pete Lyman to Recording Studio Rockstars. Pete, dude, glad to have you here. Are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Dude, it's awesome to be hanging with you. Um, Rockstars, Pete and I were chatting for quite a while while we were getting ready for this, and um, we got lots to talk about today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Dude, uh, you, so you've been in Nashville for a while. It's pretty recent since you moved out here and kind of set up shop, right? Yeah, it'll be a year in November. So um, moved moved me and the family and three cats out here and uh, just got to work. Yeah. Um, how, how are you enjoying Nashville? I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, to steal a quote from uh, my buddy Ryan Hewitt, who moved here earlier, my only regret is that I didn't move sooner. Uh, it's been It's been great. Everything, it's just, uh, you know, it's, 
it's a real music town coming from 17 plus years in Los Angeles and, you know, a little bit more than three in the Bay Area. Bay Area uh, when you're in L.A., you think it's, you know, you you kind of feel like it's the most Im- important music hub. And then when you get here, you realize you were wrong. And nice. Uh, yeah, it feels great to be here. Everyone's been really warm and inviting. Uh, it's just a, it's a, we have a really great music community here in Nashville. Dig it. So what are some other things, you know, if somebody's considering LA as a place to make records for the first time, start a career, uh, versus like your impression of Nashville, what are some things that people should consider about either of those two places or even New York, if you feel like you're familiar with that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I can't really speak to, to New York. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with New York. I've spent a, a quite a bit of time there, but and LA is a great place. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy that moved away from LA and then just shits on LA. That's not, that's not how I feel. I, I, it's a lot of things I miss about LA and I, I still go back there pretty frequently once every, you know, at least once every other month at this point. Well, it's, it's warm there a lot of the time. The right? weather is unbelievable. Yeah. There are some fantastic studios there. Uh, but you know, there's some great studios here too. So I, I, I would say, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're looking to record a record and, you know, it really depends if you're looking for a producer, if you find a great producer in LA, then, you know, go for it. But, uh, um, for me, as far as living goes, it's a much easier way of life here in Nashville. Right. You know, you moved Nash- out with family. I moved out, out with out family here, yeah. and, and my, my son, who's, uh, you know, two years old. So, you know, and, and our three cats, that was uh, a fun commute. Um, <laughs> Consider it a a myopic viewpoint, but my understanding of sometimes how people describe, you know, being in LA for a long time versus being in Nashville, it's like if you're in LA for a long time, you um, are going to probably be renting forever or for a very long time. Whereas if you're in Nashville, you may be looking to buy a home, you know. So as a as a family family man, you know, that might be a, a legitimate consideration. I don't know. For Any sure. Yeah. I, I own, I own my home in LA, but I didn't own a home in the Silver Lake Hills. I lived a little further kind of Northeast of Los Angeles, an area called Sunland. And I, I really liked it, but you know, I lived in a thousand square foot house. Uh, it's with almost no yard. <laughs> that could be a benefit. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when a thousand square foot house now, I, I think I checked Redfin recently and my old house is, they claim it's now worth about $570,000. So wow. yeah. that's what you get there in a not so good neighborhood with really poor schools and higher than average crime rate. Right, right, right. So it's, it's, to me, it just became unlivable. So Nashville is a much smaller more manageable city. You know, we decided to move out to Brentwood primarily for the schools. Um, You know, I went from a tiny lot in a thousand square foot house to almost five and a half acres with a big barn and area for my kid to run around. Pretty Uh, awesome. I love it. It's quiet. That's what I wanted. Yeah. Um, what What are some of the things that you might describe as differences in, you know, the music that's being produced in LA? What, 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 what kinds of music might somebody be likely to work on if they are in LA doing something versus Nashville? Do you feel like there's a real convergence and a lot more similarities now, or do you feel like there's still a tendency towards different styles? For sure. I mean, I I think, you know, obviously in LA, there's, there's sort of a growing, uh, and I, I never know how to label it, whether they want to call it Americana or alt country. There's definitely a kind of growing, uh, we'll just call it country, kind of real country scene in Los Angeles, especially in Eastern Los Angeles. And, you know, uh, like younger, you know, people that grew up or parents grew up listening to outlaw country and stuff. And surprisingly, a lot of these people were involved in the punk scene and sort of ended up kind of coming to this. Which is kind of your roots a little bit too, right? That's exactly what happened to me. I mean, I grew up in kind of a rural area, uh, of Colorado and, uh, I was exposed to a lot of country music from my grandmother at the time from a young age. I mean, listening to, you know, we saw Johnny Cash play when we were actually a whole other funny story. My, my, we'll talk about this later maybe, but my grandmother actually had a heart attack at the Johnny Cash show when I was with her when I was really young. 
and uh, they were trying to carry her away on the at a, on a stretcher, and she was almost refusing to go because she was scared. She didn't want to miss Johnny Cash. She's such a Johnny Cash. Yeah, it was, it was pretty <laughs> nice. But so I was exposed to that, and then then I discovered heavy metal in elementary school, and then punk rock in sixth grade, and then of course when you get into that stuff, you completely denounce anything that any adult ever right, totally, showed totally. you, you know, until you, you know, become an adult and realize, oh God, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff that I kind of missed out on and you go back and revisit it all. So, so two thoughts that come to mind. One is that, you know, what I think you're suggesting, which is as we, you know, grow up, we begin to revisit some of our, the things that may have influenced us before we became, you know, teenage rebels. But also, I wonder if there's a little bit of a connection too between, you know, the, the punk scene and um, stuff like that is all about performing together, you know, yeah. performances. And then maybe like, you know, at some point, you know, you appreciate that that country music still involves a lot of performances of musicians together. I don't know if that's an appeal. No, I, I mean, I think there's a, a direct connection between that kind of punk rock ethos and this sort of new wave of Americana and country. Yeah. Uh, it's like... It just seems, you know, getting to work with artists like Jason Isbell and John Prine and Brent Cobb, like these guys are, to me, they feel, the the reason they appeal to me so much, and I feel lucky to work on these records because I'm genuinely a huge fan. Jason Isbell is maybe my all-time favorite guitar player ever. Yeah, yeah. Had tied with Billy Gibbons. But uh, these guys... You know, I feel like the music they're playing, I have such an emotional connection to it, but I, I feel like it comes from a place where they don't give a shit about what anyone else thinks and they're writing music for themselves. And for, you know, it is outlaw country. Really, isn't it, it? it is outlaw country. And that to me is what outlaw country was all about. So that's the appeal for me. And, you know, I, I just feel lucky enough to, you know, get to sit in a room and, you know, be part of these records, listen to these records before anyone else gets to. Yeah, totally. You know? um, well, that's pretty cool, man. And, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I should know a whole lot more about the outlaw country scene here, but um, but I'm actually, you know, kind of a beginner's mind still learning. And so even just going through your discography and listening to the work you've done, I found myself, I was like, oh, that's what all these guys sound like. This is really good stuff. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. So Rockstar is a reminder, of course, as always, um, you can find links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes. And um, uh, Pete and I put together a, a YouTube playlist, so you can go check that, click through that, and you can go listen to a bunch of his great records. Um, um, mm -hmm. Listening to Brent Cobb, for example, that record that you did with him, I, I hadn't heard his music before, but that dude has an awesome voice. Yeah. His voice is like so... It just sucks you right in. And and there's definitely like an attitude of like, um, I'm just doing what I feel like doing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, there's definitely, it's definitely a country record, but I mean, like Providence Canyon, that last one is a, it's a funk record too. It's like, I mean. Yeah. And it's a it's rock a heavy record. Groove. It's a heavy groove funk record, you know? Uh, that's what's so cool about it. And what's exciting about what a lot of these, guys are doing now is it's hard to pigeonhole that, you know? I mean, and that's the, you know, that's the thing with Isbel as well. It's like, you listen to those records and, you know, you could kind of put it in that folk Americana sort of genre, but you go see him live, it's like a full-on rock show. Yeah. I mean, he's soloing like some metal shredder, <laughs> you know? It's a, it's a, it's amazing. So I think it, it, um, you know, this this stuff is attracting people that probably never thought they would have ever been interested in 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 this type of music. Yeah, and I mean the the acoustic track that um, we included in the YouTube playlist is just beautiful finger picking acoustic and just great wonderful harmonies and it just you know it's just inspiring to listen to. Yeah. You know? um, so let me, before I get into some, some more specific questions, give us a little more background on you too. So, I mean, I, I read your, your uh, bio here, but, um, you know, you talk about playing bass at 14. Were you already out playing shows and stuff at an early age? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I sort of became obsessed with music, honestly, from as early as I can remember. I mean, I think second grade is sort of the benchmark 
when I think back and think about becoming obsessed with with music and uh you know the first music I really latched onto other than the country music I'd been exposed to was heavy metal so elementary school I was just a crazy like Hesher metal kid you know and really into like you know Slayer and Iron Maiden mm-hmm. and you know like the first two Motley Crue records which I still love did you, you get know? one of those double Motorhead. string like eight string basses like I never I, I never did no but I but you know listening to Iron Maiden uh and listening to Steve Harris specifically uh and strangely enough Nikki Six they were like my first two big bass influences yeah. and then Mike Watt as well I'm a huge, huge, nice. huge Minutemen fan. Yeah, totally. Uh, um, but Firehose. That, uh, I've I've seen Firehose <laughs> play probably 15, 16 times. And didn't times. he have um his own thing at post Firehose as well? He did, he yeah. Did, he right? did a couple solo records after that yeah. with a bunch Just of Just under the, under Mike Watt, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 Great so, stuff. Yeah, huge, huge. Uh, and who was the Firehose drummer who would like spin his hair? George Hurley. George Hurley, he yeah. was great. Yeah. Oh, God. Wait, and he was a member of um, Minutemen as well, right? Yes. Both those guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So just... I actually have um, some some of my closest friends are, are big Minute uh, Men fans, and they're always trying to get me more turned on. So I'm still in the learning phase here, but I do have um, double nickels on the dime, the little yeah. 33 yeah. and a third book sitting by my bedside table up in the house and- yeah, that's uh, one of my Desert Island it. albums for sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, in, I remember the kind of you know going through the obsessive, you know, young kid heavy metal phase, and I'm sure a lot of it was kind of the cartoony aspect of it, you know, and that was in the '80s, so that was back when, when a lot of you know, I was born in '74, so some some listeners might not remember this, but that was back in the like big Satanism scare days right, when right. Geraldo did the that big Satanism, you know, right, special. Right, if you play it backwards, and, yeah, it says something. Everybody's parents were, you know, taking their kids' records and trying to play them backwards, listening for messages and throwing records away and stuff. <laughs> Luckily, my parents didn't care about any of that. They just kind of let me do my thing. But I think it was, might have been right kind of in that transition. So, So when I was a kid, elementary school was kind of like, first grade through sixth grade. And then there was junior high, which was seventh through ninth. And I think right when I entered junior high, I met, I I was really into skateboarding. That was kind of, I thought I was going to be a pro skater before I got involved in music. Uh, it was never good enough, but I, that's what I, that's what my young mind thought. And, uh, I remember there was a kid who I knew through skateboarding that went to school with me. And on the same day, he gave me a copy of Slayer's Rain and Blood uh, which I hadn't heard that album at the time because it was a little later. Like I was kind of into more of the mainstreamy metal stuff, right? Um, right. And so I wasn't really into thrash. I was I was point. busy discovering Van Halen, you yeah, know, and and like you know, ACDC. Like the cooler kids in my school already knew ACDC yeah. because of their older brothers or whatever. I, I loved I loved all that, but when I heard. On the same day, he loaned me two cassettes. One was Slayer's Rain and Blood, and one was Dead Kennedy's, uh, I think it was Frank and Christ. Nice. And I listened to both those records, two completely different records, and that that just changed me. You know what? I yeah. think it was, um, apologies if I'm remembering this wrong, but I think it was John Cuniberti who was just on the show who had recorded the Dead Kennedys. Yeah. So he was yeah. talking about I think he did quite records. a few of those records, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it was. That's cool. Very cool. But, Look, you know, that that really kind of, got me in, you know, I, I got a really cheap pawn shop bass. Uh, and you know, I kind of, I played the bass a little bit then I tried to play drums for a while, but you know, my parents weren't that well off. We couldn't afford a drum set. So I just kind of lost interest. Plus and, the punk rock beat, the boom, doo, 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 yeah. doo, that's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, you know, uh, but I, I got into, I got into playing bass and, uh, I couldn't really take lessons at the time but I had a good friend that played guitar. And so he would go, he would go take guitar lessons and then come back and he would learn punk songs. And then he would show them to me and I would just play the root notes on the bass. I didn't really know what I was doing, you know? And, and from there I started playing and, you know, put bands together. And by the time I was 17, I was getting pretty serious into bands and started touring. Uh, that was probably the first tour I ever did when I was 17. Let me ask you this. So um, some of your bass mentors, what what do you recall as some takeaways about how to either, I don't know, how to either 
play the bass well, compose the bass well for recording, or or like get a great sound out of an amp? What, did you have any learning, you know, takeaways from those mentors that you want to share with the rock stars? You know, I I mean, I really learned less is more, and I went through a couple phases. Uh, some of my former bandmates would probably probably attest to this, where I just played a lot, and I was in some bands that were kind of more like progressive technical punk bands uh and less is more <laughs> you know yeah uh it's, and i think it's important you know it's all with bass it's all you know it's all about your really your right hand technique mm -hmm. whether you're playing with a pick or your fingers being really consistent especially in recording if you're playing something with eighth notes those eighth notes better be super consistent because maybe you're fudging it live and it's not that big of a deal but when you get in the recording studio everyone's going to notice yeah well i think about you know? like mike watts and i'm thinking he was a finger bass player right he, and he, he would played, also like slap back the string yeah, sometimes he played he played with a pick on a lot of the early minimum records okay. i mean I don't want to, I'm sure there are other people out there that will scream at me if I get this wrong, but I think he played with a pick on almost everything up until Double Nickels. Okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, he's good with both. And I, I actually, like, I'm a fan of both. I was, I went through that phase for years where no picks ever. And then I, you know, in my later years, I realized, like, it's actually, for me, it's harder to play with a pick. And so I kind of forced myself to play with well, I think I feel like the takeaway is what you said, which is consistency. So, yeah. like, you know, you you could name three bass players you did. They might have totally different styles of playing, but it's probably um, and similar with drumming. It's that consistency of tone that makes it record so well, and makes it easy to mix it well. It makes it easy to you know end up with a final master where the low end is just right on a record because you know what to expect with what's going on with the, with the bass. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that was the, you know, as a former recording studio owner and a guy that, you know, just, you know, recorded whatever band called and booked a session. And that's, you know, as always, I mean, on, honestly, the bass was usually the biggest problem. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 Because it's the low end. I mean, at least yeah. kicks, you know, can be quick. Yeah. You can punch and go away and you can limp, you could, you know, compress it yeah. like crazy or something. Yeah. But I, one of the things that I always think about bass when I think about, you know, the importance of less is more, too, is that, like, without the spaces in there, without the silences, the bass note landing isn't effective. You know, yep. it's like, I mean, now, granted, there are EDM records where you just have, like, a massive assault of bass. But even those, I think, like, the bass goes away and then it reassaults you. And that's where a lot of the power and the sound of a, of a record comes from is like, you know, you need that space so that you can. Yeah. You, there's no impact if there's yeah. no space. Yeah. You know, you yeah. need, you need emptiness before you can have the big exactly. bang, you know? Yeah. It's the notes you don't play. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Dig it. So, um, I like to ask guests mm -hmm. to share an inspirational quote going out of the podcast. You got anything you want to share with us? I mean, not necessarily a quote. I, I more of a philosophy. I, I just, you know. And a lot of people have said this, so, you know, maybe it's a little, little contrived, but I, I just, I think, you know, for anyone that wants to get into this business, you know, don't let fear stifle you. When I was younger, before, before I did all of this, I, you know, even as I was playing in bands, I, my former, in a past life, I, I worked a bunch of different IT telecom jobs. So I was in my twenties playing in punk bands at night and then getting up and getting to work at seven in the morning with a suit on. And so I was lucky enough to fall into a trade. I worked for a bunch of big, uh, big tech companies uh, in Colorado and in the Bay Area. And I made good money in my 20s, but I hated it. I mean, I, I had nightmares every night about how much I hated my job. But the money was good enough that it was really hard to quit. Uh, but I, you know, I, I realized at one point like this is, you know, this is no way to live. This is, you get, you get really get one shot and you just gotta, you gotta do it. It's never, it's never, you know, the timing's never going to be perfect and the situation's never going to be perfect. And, you know, to, to, to be free, you just gotta give up that security. Yeah. I and mean, that, that's been my biggest lesson. You give up the security and bust your ass and it'll pay off. I think an important takeaway too is remembering like if you worked your ass off and you were hugely successful and you could do anything you want, what would you do? And if what you would do would be 
rock out with your friends in a band, you know, jamming out a song all day, then maybe you can skip the big giant, you know, circuitous route to get there and just start doing it. Yeah. Well, I, it was funny. I was right before I got here, uh, I was talking to my buddy Bill um, from Spectrasonics, and we were just joking. We he, he was telling me this funny thing that had happened to him over the weekend, and it kind of involved involved money. I won't go into details, but you know, I, I told him we were we were just joking about it. But I, I always think like if I won the lottery tomorrow, you know what I would do? I would just go build another mastering studio, right? You know, because I'm an idiot. I'd be like, well, what else am I gonna do? Like, you know, this I'll buy more gear, do. build another studio. Um, you know, invest in a start, start building pro audio gear. I mean, that's what I would do. I don't know how to, you know, I, don't know I how would to do say, else. I would suggest that there is a lot of non music funding in the world that has funded music and studios and recording studios. And the reason there's a probably a reason why that keeps happening is yeah. because it's fun to record and it's fun to have a studio and it's okay uh, if, you know, if it's the records you're making that aren't always paying for the studio to exist. I, I agree. I mean, you know, this is an artistic endeavor. So we have we kind of have to rely on subsidies from from other areas. And I think a, I mean a really good example of that is the the vinyl record industry. So there are a lot of guys out there working on new technology for cutting lathes and uh a lot of people don't understand how old this technology is. I mean, uh you, my Buddy Len, who's been maintaining one of my lathes for years, likes to say, uh, we're making antiques on antiques. Nice. So, but there are a lot of people out there that, you know, do other things in the engineering field that are working on new technology for us. And they're basically subsidizing it through their other work. Do you remember when somebody put up a YouTube video of somebody like they, they 3D printed a vinyl record? A couple of years ago. I don't think it sounded very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People ask me about that all the time, about HD vinyl. And I was like, honestly, I don't give a shit. Like, it's not a record. Yeah. You know, they're, one of the things that, that makes a record a record is the analog transfer process. And I don't mean, I don't necessarily mean cutting a record from, from analog tape. I mean the analog transfer through, right. through, the, through the lathe circuitry, through the cutting head. Uh, that's what's appealing about a record. You know, there are there are probably easier ways to get that music onto a slab of plastic now, but it's not the same. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I had the good fortune to be able to bring back from from a family house in Maine a, um, a couple of summers ago. I brought back my great grandfather's wind up Victrola. Oh, nice. That he bought in 1907. And I brought it down here, and I found a guy who's right here in East Nashville who has a museum in his house of old Victrolas and music I need um, to know that guy. boxes and yeah. everything. Yeah, and um, and you know, like player pianos and stuff. And uh, he he took it and he he refurbished it for me, so I've got it in like really great working shape, and it's got the the big um, paper mache horn on it and all that. But it's just so much fun to wind that thing up and listen to records on it. And again, talk about analog, you know, process. This is music that probably never even hit tape. This is probably oh, yeah. like went straight to a master um, cut cutting. I don't know if they would have called it a lathe back then, but um, you know, and then they they probably pressed a number of copies from that. Yeah, yeah. but uh, it's such an amazing sound. I know. I have I have one in my home. I have a a, a Brunswick uh, from the early nineteen oh something. I can't remember, and I bought it about eight years ago. Uh, when, and I bought it from a, a couple in Southern California that kind of a similar situation. They have a hand crank museum. It's all hand crank, wax cylinder, and uh, Victrolas. And I remember because I couldn't afford it at the time. It was obnoxiously expensive because it had been restored and had all the paperwork with it. Um, and I'm so glad I bought it. I still have it. My son loves listening yeah. to it, you know, and it's it's great. The volume control is just a baffle slide on the side and, you know, he cranks it up and puts it. Oh, so here's on. a nice detail too. So mine doesn't have a volume control on yeah. it. Um, and Carl is the name of the guy here and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spare butchering, trying to remember his last name right now, <laughs> but he is somebody I want to have on the podcast. And I actually want to have him on to just share, you know, a history of, of recorded music. Cause he's a, a real historian, but he told me, I asked him, I was like, hey, so, so Carl, how do you, how do you, I noticed there's no volume knob on this. And he was like, oh yeah, you just take, 
a cloth or something and you and you just push it, it down in. into the horn and that like kind of like clogs it up like sticking your finger in your yeah. ear and um and then he was like you know what usually what works really well is just take a sock and stick it down there and then he was like that's where the expression stick a sock in it comes from. Interesting. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. I love that. All right. So um, let's see. Why don't you, let's let's just cut right to the quick and talk about mastering a little bit. Sure. So mastering is something um, that you've been doing for for quite a quite a while. I mean, we did kind of skip past how did you get from punk rock to to that stage. Maybe we should, yeah, you know, maybe we'll hold off on mastering for just a sec. Sure, sure. And get a chance to talk about um, the studio that you created in LA, you know, the big space and making records doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I once I moved to LA, no, a number of things happened. I was in the Bay Area for a couple of years and I was playing in a band up there and the guys in the band sort of decided let's move to L- let's move to LA. I'm like, okay, sure. So I, I found another job in LA through the IT company I was working with. And then I was ready to move the day, like a day or two before we moved, the band broke up. Ugh. I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> I moved anyways. The best de- best decision I ever made. But I uh I started a uh found a warehouse space in East LA. And it was just, that was back in the Craigslist days. And um, my buddy who owned a record label at the time um, and I were both looking for a space. So we found this kind of complex of three buildings in El Sereno, which is in Northeast LA, um, just a couple minutes from downtown. You know, it was like a, a 2,000 some odd square foot building that ended up being my, my uh, recording studio. And then a small, like 500 square foot building next to it, which a record label was ran out of until I build, built my mastering studio. And then we had a small office space. So it was kind of cool. It was three completely separate buildings. We had a big, big wow. parking lot. But it and was, how, how many of, of you were there to partner up on this? So um, initially it was just, it was just me. Infrasonic was just Pete Lyman for a while. Right. Um, then I I met my friend Jeff Ehrenberg, and that's a whole long story, maybe for another podcast. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, uh, but uh, we had known he, he was a Bay Area guy, but we knew each other because our punk bands were on the same record label. Nice. So, and we also sort of became reacquainted because he started dating my ex girlfriend that I just broken up with, and owned a home with. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> I, j- I just finished watching a f- uh, Flight of the Concords. Season one, episode one, where they they have this whole the whole thing spun around like dating the same girl. Yeah, it's truly bizarre. I tell people this story and they just can't even believe it. And he so I mean he moved back his bear his band got signed to Capitol and he moved he was living in Detroit at the time his band his band had relocated to Detroit they moved to L A he starts dating my ex girlfriend that I still live with and. I, so I had right. this small project studio in a warehouse. Like they used to paint Harleys in this warehouse. It was when we moved in. It was just a nightmare. It had been graffiti. That's and, kind of what I wanted to ask you and get yeah. to too. Was like this idea of moving in and starting a studio in a place, and you know this this location and the building and stuff. Was it a was it the kind of place where you're like, oh, this is so sweet. Like, look, there's a coffee shop one block away. Not and this at is all. In the hot spot. No. You know, this was like the alley behind it is where people would like. It, it was not. I remember one day in particular, there people would abandon cars back there, and uh, what they did, what they do in LA, is they someone steals a car, they abandon it, leave it on a side street, and if no one comes to touch it for a couple of days, they just come out there and strip it. And I mean, I, I've seen cars get stripped in about two minutes in like in front of my eyes. Wow. That's what this neighborhood was like. Uh, it was. You know, it's different. It's changed a lot. It's become a little bit gentrified, but it's still mixed industrial residential. I mean, we were like 30 yards from the train tracks and the train came pretty frequently. Right. Yeah. We <laughs> have a lot, of, a lot of trains in, in Nashville too. One right across the way there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you feel like a message for uh, people who are considering, you know, creating their studio somewhere is that it's okay to be in a, you know, a little bit of a scary zone when you do this thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's it work it worked to our advantage. That was the vibe that was kind of the vibe we wanted. 
Rent was really cheap. I mean, the landlord was just a maniac. It was probably one of the sketchiest transactions I've ever been involved with. I mean, there was barely a lease. Right. Uh, he was he was nuts. He eventually sold it to another guy. So that, th- this isn't one know. of those um, locked in a 15 to 20 year lease stories. This no, is like, no, this you know, is here's like, the rent. When, do I, I have a lease? Like, right. is everything cool? Right. Uh, and it was the, you know, the studio still exists, actually. It's, it's owned by a producer named Eric Palmquist, who was, who we had as our studio manager for a while. And he bought the, the studio from us, uh, all the contents, not the building. And then, um, then we, we decided to strictly focus on mastering yeah. and build yeah. our location. Well, let's, in let's talk about, um, transitioning to mastering then. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, my introduction to mastering was, you know, it's hard to remember. It was it may have been right before I moved to LA or right when I moved to LA, but I was with my friend who I'd mentioned who had a record label and we were we were just hanging out. We were gonna go to lunch and he's like, Oh, I'm gonna go get a record cut. Do you wanna go? And at that point I was already, you know, tinkering with home recording and, and I was a, a computer guy, so I was already getting into early DAW stuff. And I was like, Yeah, I'll go. So we went to this mastering studio and I met a guy named Richard Simpson who was my mentor for years and still like my second dad. Uh, he was a RCA mastering engineer for 35, 40 years, cut some unbelievable records, worked, you know, started in New York, moved to California, uh, and he's still cutting records to this day. So we went in there to get a record cut. I can't for the life of me remember what record we were doing, but I just remember seeing the process happen and watching a lacquer get cut for the first time blew my mind. So I went back a day or two later and just kind of begged him, like, I'll do anything to learn this. You know, what can I do? I'll come in here and scrub toilets. I'll come here every day after my day job. I mean, he just said, yes. Like, Yeah, sure. And this was LA at that time. This was in LA. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of, I sort of got my start in mastering kind of the old school way. I started cutting lacquers first. So then sort of Which got, is where mastering comes from. Yep. And, then, and you know, I was already recording and getting ready to, to build the studio. Um, so that's that's sort of how I got my start. So cut a lot of lacquers. All right. Well, yeah. then let's let's do a couple of things now. Um, why don't we, since we're talking about lacquers, why don't we, why don't you just break down some of the basics for the rock stars? You know, what, what is a lacquer? What does it mean to... Um, you know, what is what is the basic process of creating a vinyl record? Well, the you know, the the basic process, so and, and let's assume the record has been mastered and EQ'd uh and is ready to be cut. Uh that's a whole separate conversation. But basically we're transforming we're we're transferring the final the final record, whether it's on tape or digital, to to the vinyl format. So uh, it's a, you know, it's an analog transfer, uh, through the console, through the cutting electronics and through the cutting head. It's, you know, really it's similar for anyone that's worked with a tape machine. It's similar to printing a mix to tape, uh, except for it's a lot more difficult and there are a lot more, you know, sort of factors involved that can affect the overall quality of, of that master. Yeah. There's a lot of variables like. I mean, not to get too deep into them, but you've got like, you know, how many grooves can you fit? You can only fit one groove on a record. There you go. (laughs) You can only fit one groove on a record because it's one continuous groove. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the, the geeky mastering engineer response to that. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, it all comes down to, you know, the frequency content of the record, how long the sides are, how you sequence the record that all affects how the record is going to sound. Maybe you can explain a little bit more. So you're you're cutting a record. You're cutting a lacquer. Yeah. What, what is a lacquer? What does that physically look like to somebody who's never well, seen it? Well, like I, you know, the the proper terminology. I think we, we, the, there's a couple different uh, stages in the process. So we'll talk about the master lacquers first. The master lacquer is a for and we're talking about standard long plane 12 inch LPs here. So a master lacquer is a 14 inch aluminum disc coated with nitrocellulose lacquer. Uh, it's 
really precisely applied and uh, it's sort of similar. The compound's similar, almost like black nail polish or something. It's very delicate. I thought you guys just spilled nitro cola all over a piece of metal. And exactly. Yeah, it. we just kind of make it ourselves, you know. But uh, the you know, and and we use a a, a cutting head uh, with a sapphire stylus that's heated slightly, that basically vibrates vertically and laterally. And cuts a, a microscopic so, groove. So into the, the heat helps it cut through the lacquer like a hot butter, a knife through butter. A yeah, and it prevents it. It uh, prevents surface noise. Cuts down on surface noise. Yeah. there's always surface noise, but the the heat helps cut through the lacquer. Surface cleanly. noise is is essentially just junk that's not your music that's moving the needle around. Yeah, as I it mean, scrapes you know, across this stuff. The noise the noise floor is always going to is you know obviously higher than it is on a CD and. Uh, you know, when you think about playing back a record, you're scraping a, a, a stylus across a piece of plastic. Yeah. There's always going to be surface, some surface noise. Yeah, but go. the heat the heat cuts down that and, and, it, and it, it facilitates a clean, clean cut. Okay, so when you cut the record, you're you've got this aluminum disc with the um, the lacquer on it. Yeah, and it cuts a groove into that, which is it's it's the same shape of the groove that would play back on my record player, right? It's like exactly. a positive, I guess yeah, you call it, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a positive, and that goes to uh, a pressing plan, and the first stage is electroforming. That a lot of people call that plating. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and this is the, the super simplified version, but they take that lacquer, they clean it off with uh, distilled water, and then they spray it with liquid silver. They silver the lacquer. And then it goes in a, a plating tank and nickel pellets are dissolved and are charged and adhere to the silvering on the lacquer. And they that produces a reverse image. So a reverse image is produced from that. And the reverse uh, image is nickel. Cor correct. Okay. So the yeah. silver, does the silver kind of go away in the process or something like that? And what you're left with is a you're Yeah, a you're negative. left with a, a, a nickel... Uh, you're not left. You're left with a nickel father. Then from that, yeah. Then then from <laughs> that, that sounds like some kind of like I know, you know Oliver Twist line. Ex or exactly. Something. Then from that, um, a positive image. The mother is made, and then from that, the actual stampers are made. Those Good are, Lord, that's a lot of things that have to be made, isn't it? There are a lot of things that have to be made. So the stampers are reverse images. There's we cut one lacquer for each side of the record. They're separate pieces, and they create. Uh, separate stampers. Those stampers get loaded onto a hydraulic press and then no, they the press, press the record from that. Let me, let me yeah. see if I grasp this again. So the the lacquer and then you um, electroplate that, which gives you a negative image that can then be made into a, a positive father yeah. or something you call positive it? Mother, and then the, positive uh, and mother. And then the stampers are made from that, which are negatives. So the positive mother, is that like your is that is that the the master that you would keep on the shelf at the record? Yeah, that's what they would use label? to create more stampers. The stampers are are you know it depends on they're usually good for a thousand records, Pressings, so they right. make mul they can make multiple stampers. Uh, no, I'm I'm no electroplating expert. That's right, you right. know I, I just well, know because I need to know it, but. Uh, but they can make multiple sets of stampers from from that. I just think it's so. cool to hear this stuff because you know most of our perspective is like, oh, we should put this out on vinyl. Yeah, and that, sure. you know, end of story. Yeah, and it's like good to know like why you have to why there's a whole process to it to getting it done. Yeah. Um, let's see what what are some other thoughts uh, and questions. I mean, I know that sometimes um, when you're working with a client and you're 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 getting a vinyl. Um, pressing ready uh you, you you have to deal with things like making sure that the the client you're working with actually can play back the vinyl on their on their turntable properly and things like that is that you want to talk about any of those issues that, that's a huge problem i mean you know we if you work with me i insist that we cut a reference acetate before we ever cut masters so the reference acetate is a record that I cut in the studio and the client can take home right away to hear how the EQ and everything is going to, how these songs are going to translate before it goes through the plating and pressing process. That way we can make any adjustments 
beforehand. So this is so, actually you you would cut the reference lacquer. I mean, excuse me, the, the reference acetate prior to actually cutting the lacquer. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Because it's, it's like it's like giving a client a reference mix. Right. You know, right. and once that's approved, we use the same settings to cut the mask. Right. Lacquer. So the lacquer is going to be the same thing as this acetate. It's exactly. because you're using the same settings. So that's, that's kinda, your re- your version of recall when it comes it, to cutting exactly. Reference. So to kind of get get to your question about client playback. I've sort of developed a long list, I'll share it with you, I'll send it to you, of, okay, here is your reference acetate clients, this is what this is, and it's a very, it's a, it's made out of the same material that we use to make the master, so it's really delicate. Uh, you have to be careful, the first, it sounds best on the first couple plays, because it does deteriorate, so I give clients a list of instructions on how to play it back. Like, these are the, this is the preferred sort of playback uh, environment you need. Uh, you know, make sure your turntable is set up properly. I send them links to YouTube videos if they don't know how to do it. Make sure your stylus is okay. Make sure your anti-skate is set up. All of that is very important. Um, don't play it on a Crosley turntable or some turntable you bought at Target because you'll destroy it. You know, 99% of, of client comments about a vinyl reference or a test pressing are usually due to playback issues. Right, right. So it's not like a a CD or a digital file where it plays back relatively the same way in every Right, exactly. iPhones are manufactured yeah. consistently, so everybody playing it back on their iPhone is going to get the same result. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. And most people out there, like honestly, I would say, I mean, you know, 60, 70%, maybe even more people that, even collect records or say they like records don't have adequate turntable setups or right, they're not right. set up properly. And it's funny because this is this process is when they figure out that they have problems with their turntable. Right. Totally. Like I can't tell you how many times a client said, stop the presses. The left and right channels are reversed. What did you do? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, uh, check check your connections or check your speaker cables. Why why is my record playing too slow or fast? It's like well, there's a problem with your turntable. Yeah, it's impossible for my lathe to to play to cut slower or faster. It just it the the motor won't even lock. Nice. So, um, yeah, you find out you find out a lot about your your turntable setup the first time you hear your own music on it. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Well, so um, we'll take a break now for just a second, then we'll come back in with more questions, and I'm going to dig deeper into, uh, you know, mastering to vinyl, get going through the prop process well, delivering your mixes for, for vinyl. Um, and also I think I'm going to ask you just for advice on, uh, those of us who want to get our first turntable too. Sure. But Rockstars, we'll see you in just a sec for the jam session. Reminder, you'll find links to what we're talking about in the show notes with our guest today, Pete Lyman. And I just click through, including a YouTube playlist of some of these great records that Pete's worked on. See you in a sec for the jam session. You have already invested in your studio speakers, headphones, and treatment of the room. And you're passionate about creating great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world. The reason is that your speakers and headphones are not telling you the whole story. The frequency response of your studio has huge peaks and valleys all throughout the low end that are completely screwing up your perspective. You may be doing your best to hit the bullseye with your mix, but your room makes the target of a perfect mix impossible to find. Wouldn't it feel great if there was a simple tool that could fix all that for you and help you get your mixes right the first time? Introducing Sonarworks Reference 4, the affordable solution to correcting your speakers and headphones in your studio. Built for Windows and Mac, Sonarworks helps you position your speakers, correct your control room imperfections, and get a million dollar sound on a home studio budget. Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com and start your journey toward the perfect mix. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. 
Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. All right, cool. Hey, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Pete Lyman, joining us here at the Toy Box Studio. Of course, his studio here in Nashville is Infrasonic Sound. Am I saying it right? Yeah, Infrasonic Sound, Infrasonic yeah. Mastering. Dig it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to keep talking a little bit more about vinyl for a moment and then dig more into mastering as, as a topic. But um, what I wanted to ask you about vinyl is, uh, well, two questions and and. I'll make them quick so that you can answer both if you want. But one is, what are some of the the uh, common errors that people make going into the process of um, of saying like, I want to, we want to do our record on vinyl and going through the process. Maybe there's some common stuff you want to talk about. Um, and then two is, um, for people who don't already have a turntable and are thinking about it. Do you have any advice for like starter turntable? I mean, you said don't get sure. the uh, don't get the target one to play your acetate on, but but maybe you've got some good guidance for us as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, some of the the common sort of you know beginner mistakes that are that are made in the vinyl process is just just assuming treating vinyl like an afterthought. It's really something the best the best vinyl records sound the best when that process has been kept in mind from the recording stage. So when vinyl was the primary delivery uh, mechanism for music, bands would go in the studio and they would mix a record cut reference acetates and oftentimes they would go back and remix songs based on how they sounded on the record. Right. Uh, no one does that now. It's like, you know, square peg in a round hole. It's like, here's my record. We had this guy master it for digital. It sounds awesome. It's super insanely loud and yeah. it's 55 minutes long. By square peg, you mean the, the shape of the wave form? By square wave. The square wave in a, in a round, circ, in a round right. record, you know? Yeah. So... Uh, people think, oh, all we have to do is cut this on vinyl, and it it doesn't really work that way. So the the there are all sorts of things you need to take into consideration if you want a record to sound good. And I would say the you know honestly the biggest one is the length of the record, length of the sides. You know there are reason why you know Beatles records were like thirty to thirty four minutes. So you keep those sides under 18 minutes. Like, sure, yeah, we can cut a 25-minute side, but it's not going to sound good. So if you really care about the way your record sounds, cut shorter sides, watch the high, weird high-frequency stuff. You know, over the years, music has just become, it just, every year, it's just like a bigger and bigger smiley face. So more bass, more, more treble. So a good target. As far as length goes, you talk about a Beatles record being 30 minutes. You mean total, so 15 total. minutes a side. Yeah. All right, yeah. so rock stars, there you go. Think about, it's really encouraging, actually, because yeah, especially 15, if, you're, 18. if you're making your own music and somebody's like, bring the bar down and you only have to make 15 minutes worth of music twice and you've got a record, that's pretty encouraging, I think. I mean, I I, I really don't understand the need to to do a record longer than 40 minutes. Most of my favorite records are are under that. Uh, I mean, not to say that there aren't a bunch of great records that are longer than that, but, you know, I think that's the rule. If it can't, you know, I mean, no one cares about CDs anymore, and CDs caused everyone to right. try to cram 74 minutes on, on into an album. Yes. Uh, it actually, that, that actually literally is very exactly that happened yeah. to us. My co-producer was like, a CD can hold 74 minutes of music and we've got, you know, oh, 29 poems and we're going to make 29 <laughs> other musical bits to go between them. So we ended up with like 74 minutes was the target, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's insane to me. I don't think humans have that attention span. 
We were pretty insane. Yeah. <laughs> Long drives back in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, cool. So 15 minutes aside, that's a good good target yeah, 15 for- 15 to 18, I, I think. Okay. You know? I mean, you can do, I routinely cut sides that are 22 minutes. I don't like to, but you can. And oftentimes you can get good results. It really has a lot to do with how you sequence the record too. I got to write fewer lyrics if I go with 15 minutes. You know? There you that's go. I got to say yeah, about yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, just you know, the thing to keep in mind is you start to you start to distortion increases as you get towards the in, inner diameter of the record, and you start to lose high end too. So it's like uh, something like you know three dB shelf down at fifteen k by the time you hit the seven inch diameter on a twelve inch. That's pretty significant, and there's no way to overcome that. So that's that's one of the things you have to understand when you sequence your record. Put your Maybe put a ballad or your quieter songs on the inside of the record. Don't put that really slamming song as the last side, right. last song on the side. Right, because the needle doesn't get to travel as far once it's, yeah, in it's closer to the middle not, of the record. It's right? not tracking in in as optimum as a, of a position as it is if it's on the first one or two cuts. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. are there any classic albums where that kind of arranging of songs comes to mind, where you think it, it really was a good choice, or any ones where like the classic examples of a bad choice? Oh man, that's kind of hard to. Let's think put of you now. on the spot. I mean, you know, I, I think so many of so many classic records. They were was, they were thinking it, about it, this. They stuff. were thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. So you know, and and that's the other thing about a lot of classic records is people. I used to have arguments with people all the time. Bands are like, "Well, I've got this." so-and-so record, this John Coltrane record has a 28-minute side. I'm like, well, yeah, but seven minutes of that is pretty much almost silence. Right. Which is an which is a time on when you're when you're cutting where you can pack that groove in and save a lot of space. It's, you know, music now is like it's like typing in all caps. It's relentless with almost zero <laughs> dynamics. So that takes up more space on a record. Yeah. And uh the frequency spectrum is a lot different than it was in the 60s or 70s, you know. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you talk about a, like old classic country records, an engineer friend of mine, we we're talking about the the Buck Owens thing, you know, and of course, you know, Buck owned a bunch of radio stations in uh in kind of the Bakersfield area of California, all in the Central Valley there. And his kind of rule, I think, was like nothing under, was it nothing under 100 or nothing under 150? Really? Yeah. One, those one, 100 hertz? Loud. Wow. There's no low end. Low end is what takes up all the space on yeah. the record. So he realized, well, this is all stuff for the radio. You know, people think the loudness wars just started, but it was going on back then. So you could cut those records insanely loud when there's no low end. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, and mid-range is the uh, the final frontier anyway, right? Yep, yeah. All, um, all right, dig it. So let's see. Um, let's ask this question. So again, let's say for somebody who's like, I, I really do enjoy records when I hear them at my friend's house, and I know there's this whole vinyl resurgence going on. What advice do you have for somebody who's just like, you know, I really want to get started with a turntable and something going, you know, at my home or studio or whatever, where do I begin? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good resources out there. Uh, there's a company called Needle Doctor that is awesome. I've ordered a bunch of stuff from them. They're, they're a really good resource. I mean, you can get a turntable there. You know, I mean, honestly, I believe that you've got to, at the very least, you're going to need to invest at least three hundred dollars to get anywhere near a decent it. decent playback. Okay. And and then you know, we have to answer a bunch of other questions. You know, do you do you own a phono pre? How good is it? Right. Uh, 300 on the turntable, rock stars. You got to have the stereo to play it back. So. At least. I mean, I, I would say 500. I mean, my, you know, one of the, my main turntable at the studio now is a, a Marantz TT51. And to me, that's a budget turntable and that's around 1500. Um, I always remember the, uh, the, the Techniques 1200 or yeah. something being a, a classic DJ turntable. Yeah. 1200 is great. Uh, but, uh, a new 1200 now, which they make now from Japan, that's going to run you about 2,500 bucks. No really? stylus. Wow, wow. And the used ones would be at least a grand. Uh, you know, they're great direct drive turntables. Uh, and maybe those are easier for some people. Those are, I mean, those are great turntables. And there's comparable ones out there that, you know, I mean, I think Audio Technica makes one that's kind of, kind of looks exactly like a 1200. And I think it even has a built in phono pre. 
and that that might be suitable with a good with a good stylus. You know? Well, I have to say, um, um, my girlfriend has a turntable that is, you know, one of these all in one things. It even has a, a Bluetooth, you know, switch yeah. for it. Yeah. And um, still, you go play the Rat Pack album on it, and it sounds awesome yeah. compared oh. to everything else you you play on there. So. If you kind of I mean, can't go it, wrong. Yeah, if it works and for casual listening, that's great. But if you know, if you're getting into vinyl and if you're in a band and you're going to put out a record, yeah, and you're going to press your own and, and you, you need to you proof it. Yep, you need something. You need something decent. Yeah, dig yeah. it. All right, so let's talk about mastering. Um, what the hell is mastering? I mean, really, ma- I mean, in simplest form, mastering is compiling the the album and the final mixes for its final, uh, you know, final production format. So, and, you know, over the years, it's become more and more of a creative process where originally it was like, you know, a mix engineer created a, a, a tape and that was transferred to vinyl and the mastering engineer wasn't allowed to do anything but make sure that was a clean transfer from uh, tape to vinyl. And obviously now it's become like the, the last step to really sculpt and mold the record and turn it into a cohesive you know, combination of, of songs. Yeah. And you, yeah. um, you know, you, we've talked about getting it onto vinyl, but of course there's digital delivery formats. And then, um, is there also like a cassette resurgence going on too? Are you delivering cassettes sometimes? Yeah. You know, from time to time, I, I don't do. I miss cassettes, man. Yeah. I love cassettes. Yeah. I love cassettes. I've, I've got crates and crates of cassettes at home. My, my car is a 2004 Volvo. It still has the cassette player in it. <sighs> Man, that's awesome. And it's really fun to like, you know, break out the old band tapes and, you know, it's not so much fun how shitty our playing was, but it's pretty yeah. awesome to listen to it on there. <laughs> I've got a bunch of those too. So equally is probably equally as embarrassing, maybe even, maybe even worse, but uh, yeah, I mean, we do cassettes from time to time. Generally, I think most of the cassette duplicators are, are kind of you know, smaller operations, and they're just usually working from wave files. They're just working from the digital files. So. Um, I actually find that, you know, one of the things that was lovely about cassettes, you know, back even, you know, I was in ADAT world or whatever, yeah. and we would we would take our multi-track recording and mix it through my little Mackie VLC 1604 mixer or whatever, and then that would go to a DAT, but then the DAT transfer would go to a cassette, and that's what we'd take to the car to go listen to it. And there was a thing, you know, that was going on in that going from your mix to the cassette where you got that extra layer of tape compression that really did a thing to the sound that um, when when we tried to take some of those same approaches and skip the cassette part of the process, like we we, we lost something. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I... I I, I know a lot of people still will record, you know, they'll bring those, you know, Porta Studios into the studio and record tracks on those and bounce them into Pro Tools. Yeah. Because they like the sound of not just the tape compression, but a lot of people like the sound of those those crazy mic pre's too. Yeah. They've you got know? a nice crunchy distortion that Ex- sounds pretty awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm with you on that. I, pr- I probably need to break mine out and, and start experimenting again. Rockstars, it's frustrating because there is like a never ending list of experiments we're really supposed to be doing in the studio when we finally get around to it, you know? Yeah. But we were yeah. looking over at the, the Effectron delay over there and the prime time and oh. my rack. And I was kind of like complaining about how like, you know, I don't use it as much as I want. The four track upstairs, it's just, yeah. it seems, it almost seems like we used to do a whole lot more of that before we got everything into the computer, you know? That was the yeah. only way to get sounds was to like manipulate and go through outboard gear and stuff. Yeah. Use real, you know, analog tape machines for tape delay, for slap and... Um, yeah. Well, so tell the rock stars more about the mastering process. So like, what are some of the tools that get used for mastering, how, when, and where do you use them? And also describe your mastering studio to us. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the mastering studio. So I have a, a new room here in the Green Hills area of Nashville. Uh, and the room is sort of centered around uh, PMC BB5 XPD loudspeakers and kind of the big uh, 
towers, four fifteens with um uh, Those are monsters, right? When you turn them on, they knock you over they, physically, yeah, right? Yeah. I always describe them as like if you're at a football game, you see a guy with like the big foam hand, you know, the number one. They're sort of the <laughs> the big foam hand of of speakers. But awesome. I, I love them. Uh, they're the, you know, I always say that, you know, they can bury me with those speakers. They're my last, last speakers I get. The only thing that I would eventually go to would just be another pair of PMCs. Can you actually yeah. like get into the speaker to be buried? I mean, it's, uh, it's almost uh, that big. Easy. I mean, I could get into, there's... There's four sections of the speaker. I could fit into one of them. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. So the studio is based around those and a Masalik transfer console. Um, you know, we can talk about gear all day long. It's funny. I purposely, on, on my website, I don't list the mastering gear I use. If people want to know, I, I tell them. It's all, I you you know... I use the gear that I use because I like the sound. So I think uh, I'm I'm more curious rather than geeking on specific yeah. models so much. I'm I'm more curious about like you know what are the tools for signal flow and mastering. Oh, sure. you know, how's it different from a multi track yeah. studio? You know, I mean, usually it's you know less gear but higher quality, discrete mastering grade gear, stepped switches instead of pots. So, you know, we, we need to have the ability to recall everything, uh, exactly. And, you know, compressors with lower thresholds, EQ that are in like quarter with lower thresholds. What does that stepped. mean that with lower? I mean, thresholds? just, you know, like for instance, uh, you know, a, a normal, normal compression ratio, excuse me, that's better. Verb, oh, ratio, be like right, ratio right, not right. threshold, but you know, 1.5 to one. We're not, you right. know, it, it's a, I think it's a myth that, that, mastering engineers i think people think that mastering engineers engineers use more compression than they actually do I, I, you know i, I kind of wonder if that came out of the the cd loudness wars where like people yeah. really expected mastering engineers to do magic to make something like insanely loud you know well the you know the loud the loudest masters come from the loudest mixes right i mean if you mix for loudness and what i mean by that is like if you control your transients and and peaks in your mix and make sure everything sits nice and tight that's gonna be that's gonna generate if you're really looking for volume that's gonna that's gonna generate a louder better sounding master than if it goes to mastering and we have to and you're expecting it to be that right, loud you're trying to compensate you know, so, yeah. you know it's a lot easier to control certain elements in the mix to make something louder and i don't mean brick wall limiting your mix i mean delivering like a, a nice like cohesive like kind of well well mixed package if that's what you're going for if you're going for loudness yeah. then it's really starts in the mix sometimes i feel like uh you know a way to describe a loud mix is you know don't crank up the volume like turn turn it down a little bit and do you hear everything pretty damn well you yeah. know then it's loud you know yeah yeah. Whereas, like you know, if I do a mix and and things are lost in there, that's where I might feel like I'm struggling. Like I wish I could get it louder or something. Yeah, you know, bring, yeah. Bring things forward a little bit. I more. think it's a it's a big mistake, and not to go off on this tangent, but every once in a while, I'll work with a new engineer, and they'll send stuff in, and I'll get the mixes, and they just sound really strange. Kick and snare are way too hot. Right. And they're and I'll call them and ask them, hey, what's going on? And like, oh well, you know, I did that on purpose, so. They would, you know, so they would still sit well after it was mastered. It's like, no, mix your song how you want it to sound. And if you're sending it to a mastering engineer that that sends you back something completely different, maybe you're working with the the wrong engineer. And I mean, unless you're specific, you're specifically looking for that. Right. right. I think that's a strange approach. Um, do you find that sometimes a mixer will mix through a limiter and and overcompensate with kick and snare because it's getting limited and then take that limiter back off and send you that version, which sounds all out of whack. That happens occasionally. Uh, and I usually have a conversation with them about yeah, it. I well, mean, only when I send you mixes. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I personally think if you're mixing into a limiter, then you need to make sure you send a high res version with the limiter on to the mastering engineer. Right. Don't expect someone to recreate some sort of magic balance that you had uh, just because they're a mastering engineer doesn't mean they're going to automatically know that, you know, you were slamming kick and snare into a limiter and you take it off and the mix doesn't sound like anything anyone's approved. Yeah. Don't, don't undo decisions that you've already made if they were good decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, I have no, you know, honestly, I've, I'm pro mix bus compression and mix bus EQ. And if a engineer is using a limiter creatively and that becomes part of the glue of the song, they should keep it on. 
I'm not the one call you will never get from me as a mastering engineer is, Hey, can you send me a version with the limiter off? And I've talked to other people about that before. Like, especially if it's coming from a, if it's a good mix coming from a good mixer, my suggestion to a client, if, if a mastering engineer calls you and asks you for a version with the limiter off and you know, you have a solid mix, you should tell them, I'm sorry, I'm going to find another mastering engineer. <laughs> like our job is not to to remix your song. Right. Unless you specifically ask for something completely different. Right. But, uh, you know, I think it, there are times when a mix comes in and it's 99% there. And my job at that point is to get out of the way and just make sure it sounds great. Well, you're only trying to bring 1%. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, if like, I, you know, I, just working on a record right now that, Andrew Shep's mixed and it's like his mixes come in loud and I just get out of the way because they're almost perfect. Yeah. So my job is to transfer those to the final, final master. You don't always need to be doing a bunch of processing. And, you know, my philosophy is use the least amount of processing possible to, to achieve, you know, a great sounding master. Well, Andrew was uh, kind enough to join us on the show. So Rockstars, if you haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to the Andrew Sheps episode as well. Yeah, he's a um, he was serious awesome. badass. Yeah, he's yeah. just such a cool dude too. Yeah. And he also sh- um, shared some really eye-opening insights into the mix process where he talked about like, you know, mixing on a laptop with a pair of headphones and, yeah. and like, you know. Um, well, he, I think he's proof that it's about knowledge and skill and not about gear. Right. Totally. I mean, obviously, yeah. he can use whatever he wants. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure he probably talked about it, but I'm pretty sure he's all in the box now. Yeah, I think and it was all in the box on he's a pair amazing. Of Sony headphones. He actually did mention something called the the um, I believe it was the Red Dragonfly, a little oh, headphone yeah. Yeah. amp that you can plug into your. I've got one of those. So yeah, little, I bought it immediately. Dab. You know yeah. what? I'm embarrassed to say I still haven't taken it out of the box yet because I realized after that I was like, I got this thing. It's so great. I can't wait to try it. And then I was like, Oh wait, I'm never mixing on my laptop, so I don't. I haven't unboxed it yet, but there's another but great, great DAC that's uh, not to go off on this tangent, but that's similar to that that I think is a little better. It's more expensive, but the Apogee Groove, mm-hmm. which is a small unit, but it has volume control too, which is kind of oh, nice. Yeah, it's a, it's probably twice the price of the Dragonfly. They both sound great, but it's kind of nice because it has volume control right on the unit. Well, I remember back in the day. I don't know if it sounded all that great, but Pro Tools sold a little, you know, USB dongle. Oh yeah. With a volume control on it, and I used to use those just to to mix and work on stuff on my laptop as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, dig it. All right, so uh, let's see. I asked a couple of questions about that. Um, I guess, you know, you talked about being creative um, in the studio and, and uh, part of the mastering process as well. I wanted to ask you, what are, what do you feel like are some of the ways that, you're, that you like to push the envelope creatively through mastering? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I like to, the way I approach a record is I, when I, when I get a record in, I sit down and just listen to the entire record as a a listener, as a try to put my just music fan hat on. And so I go in and I sequence the record and then I just sit and listen to it. And then I, I think from there, it gives me an idea of where it needs to go. Then I just try to kind of visualize where, like, okay, what type of record is record is this? You know, what are some comparable things? Where should this sit? And then from there, that's kind of where the, the creative fun would start. So, I mean, it, you know, for instance, if I got a record in that was kind of sterile sounding, maybe recorded on a budget at home, didn't have a lot of kind of analog vibe. I'm using air quotes there. You can't right. see that on the podcast. You hear that. But, uh, you know, that might involve transformer saturation, uh, you know, compression, different EQ techniques to try to breathe some sort of analog life into it. High frequency limiting. That's a, I'm a big fan of high frequency limiting I have a whole th- theory about that what is high frequency limiting you know i high frequency limiting is just you know just limiting a specific band so a lot of people talk about how they love that you know everyone talks about that analog sound but no one can really describe no one knows what the hell does that mean it's a yeah. weird thing but i think one of the reasons that people are so attached to older records especially records when 
vinyl was the only medium uh, or cassette was that the you know in order to facilitate a clean cut, the cutting engineers had to use high frequency limiting to sort of tame that the sort of extra high frequency hash that would cause splats and distortion on records. So that kind of adds this nice sort of soft kind of pillowy feel. So I, I use a lot of high frequency yeah. limiting in, in just my mastering in general. I'll I'll push high end into the limiter. Okay, dig it. Um, so things like EQ compression limiting, um, band band limited limiting. I don't know if that's the right way to describe it. Um, Sounds awesome. Is it so. you know it, for those of us trying to just conceive of what mastering does? Do we imagine that mastering might be like you know uh, doing some tasteful EQ one time and some compression one time and some limiting one time, or does it get much more um, complex than that? Might you have like EQ going into compression, EQ coming out of somewhere else and, you know, all kinds of it, creative things like that. But it's little, you know, it's little bits of EQ. I mean, you know, from a mastering engineer in, in most most circumstances, a half dB is a, of EQ is a big move. Right. So a lot of little massaging uh, of EQ. What about notch filters? Do you get more? Um, do you get bolder with if you're notching out a frequency? I mean, if if there's a if there's an issue with a mix, like you know, let's say there was a acoustic guitar and there was a a bad cap in somewhere in the electronic chain and there's like, you know, some spike at 16 K then sure. We'll use a pretty aggressive notch filter to cut that out or we'll use, you know, we'll go into isotope and RX seven. Okay. So, so here's a, here's a tough question. How do we know that there's a spike at 16 K most of us? Oh, you can't hear it. You can't hear that. Do we we hear a spike at 16 K? Do we have nice meters that are showing us things like that? So yeah, is, is being, tuned into the visual tools that you use also an important part of mastering? Yeah. I mean, the visual tools are important, but it's important to just have them and forget about them. I don't Mm -hmm. rely on visual meters. I'm a big VU person and that has a lot to do with starting with vinyl. Uh, So I rely on my VU meters, you know, when I'm adjusting loudness and everything, but I have digital meters and RTAs and you know, spectrum analyzers. And, you know, when you, when you hear something going on up there and I'm, you know, I have big full range, uh, speakers and you can, you know, it's, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear those issues there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the mastering room is the microscope. The mixing room is the, the the creative playground. playground. Yeah. Yeah. So you're obviously not going to hear that 16 K spike on your NS 10s. And if that does happen, maybe it's too late because you just blew your tweeters. But uh, but you're going to hear that stuff on my system. Yeah. Yeah. All right, dig it. Um, let's see, what else I want to ask you about? There's, you know, you mastered some really sweet sounding acoustic music like Jason Isbell and Chris Stapleton, um, as well as powerful rock stuff like C6 Steve and Panic at the Disco. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the similarities and differences in mastering those different extremes of music? I mean, you you know, it's it's basically. I mean, it's all the same process. It's and I'm such a music fan that I don't really. It's it's not really hard for me to switch gears. Uh, I mean, I would say the the biggest struggle working on a like a loud rock record, like you know, like something like a Weezer record or Panic or you know. C6 Steve is just, there's, there's, you know, they're generally brighter sounding records and more aggressive, a lot of like three, five K energy that might not be going on on some of those other records. So, uh, that'll, that'll wear you out. Like, you know, it's, it's, a it's a lot harder. It can be harder to work on those records for an extended period of time, but I listen at pretty relatively low volumes, but yeah, I think it's all about trying to just interpret, interpret, ew, interpret <laughs> what the uh, you know what the 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 artist wants and what yeah. the producer wants, and try to make you know try to think about you know what other records is that going to kind of be like what where is that going to fit, and and 
you know, where, where is it sitting currently? You know, and it, it really depends on the producer too. I mean, yeah. work like C6 Steve record, you know, anything Vance Powell does. Vance is one of those guys where it's pretty nailed. It's pretty dialed. So it's just get out of the way, make it louder, you know, might be cleaning up a thing, a few things here and there making, you know, making sure all the songs uh, sound good together. And, uh, but he is incredibly consistent. Um, some of your favorite mixers, when they deliver a mix to you, are there any things about how you would describe that? I mean, other than sounding great as far as, you know, stuff like headroom that you find is consistently a wise choice? That is a good question. Uh, cause I would say my handful of favorite mixers are sort of all over the board in regard to headroom. Uh, like with a guy like Vance, he's you know, he's very analog. Even when he's recording to Pro Tools, he's mixing on his console. Everything's coming out at zero. And like all of his mixes, when I get, when I set up his mixes, I send that, like they all go out through my analog chain at the exact level that I have all my stuff calibrated at for the most part. Now, but there's a lot of other mixers that send stuff in really hot, like like Sheps, um, uh, Reed Shippen. And doesn't matter because their mixes are so solid. If I really am worried about headroom, I mean, I have the ability to turn it down and then turn it back up on the output if I need to. So, right. um, you know, but but with with guys like that, they're also incredibly consistent. So, you know, they don't deliver one mix 10 dB lower than another mix because they understand how to they understand how to hit their mix bus. Right. Within an so, album, within a collection of exactly, songs on an album. Yeah. Well, God, even within multiple artists. I mean, like a guy like like Reed Shippen, I mean, his his mixes come through. I mean, he's he's consistent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And because an he's because he's got he has his workflow and gear dialed in. So th- those are the best sounding mixes in general, people that are just, you know, that stay consistent from mix to mix. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so, so we're talking about, you know, some acoustic albums and some some loud records as well. Uh, so it does beg the question: How loud is loud enough? You know, I I don't like, I don't get on a soapbox about this loudness wars thing. I think it's absurd. It's not a war. Like, if you want a loud record, you want me to make a loud record, I'll make it. It's not what I would prefer to do. Do you, do you instinctively go someplace as a mastering engineer and then maybe somebody requests, you know, more or less half from there? That's happened. Yeah. I, I, I think these days, you know, I, I work with a lot of the same producers. I'm lucky enough to have, you know, I get pretty consistent mixes in most of the time. And most of the new clients that come to me, they come to me because they like records I've done. So that's usually a good benchmark. Right. I know if they come to me and they cite like, oh, I love that Chris Stapleton record or the Brent Cobb or the Jason Isbell record. I'm like, okay, well, if they're really into Isbell and Stapleton, they're not worried about this being the loudest record. But if someone comes to me because they liked the Fall Out Boy record I did, then I know they're going to want their record to be a little bit more competitive and it's going to maybe fit in the pop world as opposed to, you know, uh, a record that can kind of kick back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, I think those same records are probably like, that's probably where my ear gravitates towards too. I like being able to hear some space and tone and yeah, I like to be able to turn it up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, I mean, I prefer that, but there's some, there's some records I've done that are really loud that I'm super proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, loudness is such a weird thing because there are, there are instances where clearly the loud, the louder thing sounds better on some listening environments that I do. And sometimes, you know, either something I'm making or something that I'm appreciating that isn't, you know, competing at that same kind of volume sounds exactly just right when it's not super, super loud. So yeah, I guess it's just, it's the gut. You just trust your gut and your ears and Go where it belongs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, this is all of the loudness stuff is it's not driven by consumers. It's driven by artists, right? And labels. You know, 
I mean, I've never heard anyone complain about the Stapleton records or the Isbell records not being loud enough. Right. And I mean, so all that stuff I heard sounded great. They're quiet compared to, you know, I mean, for most artists, if I turned in a master that quiet, they would ask me, why is it so quiet? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it, those records are proof to me that really no one cares. By the time it hits Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music anyways, it's all normalized. It's, it's, you know, it's not really that big of an issue. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, so I wondered if you maybe share a story about uh, working with Chris Stapleton and getting the Grammy nomination um, for Record of the Year. That's That must have been pretty exciting. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's not really any huge story behind that. I mean, that record, Traveler, was a, is a good example of just getting the hell out of the way. I mean, Dave Cobb and Vance Powell killed it. So, you know, what you're hearing on that record is as close to the mix as possible. That was pretty much a flat transfer through my system for the most part. Wow. I mean, it's, you know, a tiny bit of limiting, I think, like maybe like a quarter dB or something. The mixes were so consistent. They spent so much time on that record. So it was just a, a joy to work on it. And yeah, like I said, I mean, it was, you know, that's, I mean, that's Vance Powell. <laughs> Those are... That's that's pretty close to, you know, what the mixes sound like. And that's, you know, I mean, really, that's that's what should be happening most of the time. Yeah. But I, I remember, and it's funny, I always use this as an example of like, you know, oftentimes people will ask me, new artists, like, what do you think I should do? Like, I'm looking at this marketing campaign and I'm doing this. I'm like, you are asking the wrong guy. Because when it comes to that sort of thing, I, you know... I like to stay out of that end of the business and I realized I'm a really I'm really bad at sort of predicting what people are going to like or what's interesting. You know, I just kind of have my job that I do it. And when the Stapleton record came out when we mastered it, I remember thinking, you know, I, I mean it was on a, you know, a, a major label and I remember thinking, wow, this record is amazing. I can't imagine it's going to be that big of a deal cuz I just I, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of um I just thought this is a great sounding record and it's like how are people going to appreciate it cuz it's not a pop country record. Mm. And then when, you know, then when that CMA live thing with Timberlake happened, which most people at this point know about that are interested in Stapleton, I mean, it just took off and just hasn't stopped. So, it's a good example of me having no idea Right. Uh, what I'm talking about in regards to how popular a record's going to be. You know? I think that's a, so, a common story that you hear a lot too, is yeah. like, you never know when you're making your biggest hit. Exactly. I mean, I knew it was a great record and I immediately liked it because it's right in my alley, you know, and I love, I loved, I love everything about it. And, uh, that was kind of what I thought. I'm like, I love this record. That means no one's going to like it. <laughs> um, I was just yeah. down in Muscle Shoals and I was yeah. talking to David Hood who played bass on, um, in the Swampers and I think it was David who shared, who said the same thing. He's like, you just never know when your biggest hit's going to be. They were talking about Bob Seeker, old time rock and roll. Yeah. And like, nobody knew that was going to be his biggest selling record ever, you know, kind yeah. of stuff, if, yeah. which I think is accurate. Um, well, very cool. All right. Well, so let's jump into some of the final questions here. Um, when you were starting out, I don't know if this is back when you were 14 and playing punk rock bands, but... Um, you know, at some point along your recording career, what do you feel like was holding you back? You know, I don't really feel like anything was holding me back. I mean, there were, you know, when I was a young kid getting involved in music, the the hardest thing for me was probably just the financial aspect of being able, you know, to afford an instrument uh, as a young kid. And, but I just found a, found a ways around that, you know? I mean, if you want to do something, you're going to find a way to do it. Well, you, I thought it was cool that you talked about, you know, getting the job with the IT company. And then um, you, you didn't say this, but I thought it, which was when you moved from San Francisco down to L.A. Yeah. It was kind of smart that you had looked for work in a big company that could, you know, you, you could transfer. I got really lucky. That was my safety net that got me to Los Angeles and and allowed me to get sort of my recording mastering career yeah. off the ground. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is really a, a legitimate equivalent, but I do think about, you know, 
ride sharing jobs that people might pick up with Uber and Lyft, for example. And that is one thing you you could learn how to do that well in one city, move to a new city, and you know everything you need to know yeah. when you get there. Other than getting to learn the city, itself. that's a that's a perfect musician's job. You can do it when you need to do it. You can go on tour. No one's gonna complain that you're off work. Just you know? just don't use the fifteen passenger band van for all the ride sharing. Maybe get a little little thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. dig it. So, um, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? I mean, we could, you know, we kind of touched on it before, but I think less is more in general, you know, with music composition, with mastering, with recording, just get the, you know, the best sounds you can and from from the best players. I mean, you know, it all I mean, Everything that we're doing here, it all starts with the musician in a room with an instrument. You know, is that, can that mus- musician play? Is their instrument properly set up? Um, do they have good songs? None of this, the stuff we do matters if, if that stuff isn't in place. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I kind of go back to the punk rock stuff when I use that as an example, because you know, one of my other Desert Island albums is uh, Husker Du's Zen Arcade, and that is a masterpiece of a record. And I think, you know, I think it was recorded and mixed in 72 hours. Is that one of the Albini? No, like this is before that. Before that. Um, I can't remember who recorded it, but uh, it sounds crazy. It, I mean, it it's not a good sounding record, but it you it doesn't matter. It just it the songs are amazing. Yeah, the energy. So it's like right. proof that like. Really, what matters is the you know is the artist and the song. Yeah, uh, we're all here just to reinforce that. I mean, I think you know I'm I'm super super flattered that you even asked me to do this. But uh, it's funny after doing a couple records that people seem to like and and meeting people, they're like, "Oh, you did these records." I'm like, "I'm a mastering engineer. I'm not the guy that I'm not the artist." Like I'm just lucky enough to do my job with these people. I mean, we're all we're the ones supporting them. You know, we're not like, like I'm not the rock star. You know, I'm just lucky enough to get to take the ride. Let me, let me <laughs> you ask you this question in context of of the rock stars listening to this. Um, what are some clues along your journey that you might want to, you know, go into making records with the bands through tracking, producing, tracking, mixing? Versus you might want to take a mastering, a path towards mastering. How did you know that maybe going towards mastering was a, was a cool idea for you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I spent a number of years kind of in both worlds. And they just kind of, there came a point where I, I, I became, I think my brain just works at a higher level thinking about the overall mix and not trying to pick apart each individual element, but thinking of how to make this this mix sound as good as it can. Um, selfishly, I also like I like the workflow of mastering. I like getting to work on a bunch of different projects in a week or even in a day. Um, selfishly. I like the hours a lot better (laughs) than tracking. Uh, I usually get to deal with artists after all the bullshit's been dealt with, after all everyone, after everyone's argued about the tracking, the mixing, the, you know, the sequencing, all of the label stuff. Um, And I I, I almost imagine that at the mastering stage, um, you've got all these people watching your back that aren't going to let you fuck up the record. Like yeah. you can get you can get it right, but if you're getting it wrong, they'll probably let you know right away, and you just yeah. you know redirect. Sure. Well, our job we're the guys that can't make any mistakes. That's our job, right? right. We're, we're you know we're the I mean that's another you know another big aspect of mastering is final you know final quality check. That's our job. I remember that um, in the CD era, it was like if you if it goes to mastering, somebody at the mastering or somebody at that stage has to listen to that final reference, I guess it was a CD or a DDP yeah. or something that's going to the pressing plant and listen acutely and make sure that there was no little hiccup, whatever, you know, and that's, yeah. that's a lot of work right there. We still do that. You know, I mean, we actually, we do that two or three times. I give a final QC on, on my, 
like using my speakers and then headphones and then my assistant gives it a meticulous quality check with headphones you know notes every tick and pop even if it's in the original recording uh that's our job you know and really that's the that's the most important part of our job this is the you know we're creating the pre-master that's going to be turned into hundreds or hundreds of thousands or in some cases millions of copies of the record so uh, if we screw it up, it's going to be a really big problem. Yeah, somebody has to write a very large check for that too. Yes, yeah. Um, so that's that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I was, I guess, what I was thinking about of is trust. It's a big, big trust building process, I imagine, and that's a trust that's probably extremely valuable and something not to be taken lightly. Yeah, I mean, I think you know. With this, with the engineer, the recording engineer, producer, mastering engineer relationship is you find someone that you sort of jive with and that you trust and, you know, and that trust is built over time. And then eventually you get to the point where you're just on autopilot. And, you know, like, for instance, I mean, the records I do with Dave Cobb, we've been working together for so many years that, uh, I mean, he just sends records. We don't even talk about them most of the time because we... We both, I know what he wants. He knows what I'm going to do. Uh, and, you know, we just usually knock it out first round. Yeah, it's always a pleasure when you find people that you can work with consistently and regularly yeah. and, and really build a team feeling. Um, all right, well, so now how about, uh, you know, if you've got one, would you like to share a recording tip, hacker secret sauce, something that will help the rock stars make their next record? Well, um, yeah, I'm um I'm trying to think of, you know, most I mean most of my sort of, you know, most of my secret sauce sort of tips would be on the mastering side. Sure, we'll give it. So, I mean, we all yeah, love like, we all love pretending we can master our own records, you know, yeah. with, with plugins and all that. So give us give us a little secret sauce. I mean, it'll keep us busy for an afternoon playing around in the studio for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think secret sauce stuff is kind of, you know, and, and this would be you know, for going for a more sort of vibey sort of master, if, you know, and sort of emphasizing maybe elements in the, in the master that weren't there. Uh, but, you know, fooling around with transformer saturation, uh, high frequency limiting, the big one. Like I said, I'm a huge, I have kind of a secret weapon, high frequency limiter that I use that was specifically designed for vinyl cutting that I use in my analog mastering process. So, so if we were going to experiment with that, we might even just take a multi-band compressor and just turn off the bottom three bands and yeah. start seeing what it does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, my my favorite sort of, uh, I, oftentimes if I, if I need to do something in the box for a certain reason, I, I emulate my hardware. Um, High frequency limiter with uh, the Brainworks BX2. I don't know if you love that, that plugin. Yeah, oh, man, I I like it better than the newer than the the V3, uh, the newer version they have. But the high frequency limiter on that thing is great. You know. Oh wait, I don't know if I, I'm I don't know if I'm thinking about the one with the limiter on there. I I've, I have the EQ. Yeah, the I think the the BX2 is the limiter with kind of everything. Oh, okay, dig yeah. it, dig it. All right. Yeah, that thing's really fun to play with. I use yeah. the uh, the the Brainworks EQ, which has like the stereo widening. On yeah, it too, which sounds this great. this does too. Maybe it might be the same one. Maybe yeah. maybe it's well. Um, it's a wonderful sounding EQ. Yeah. In fact, I, every time I've done any of my own mastering, I've I always break that one out because I like the way it sounds a lot. Yeah, and it does seem to have a smooth a nice sort of rounded quality to it or something. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about like a super aggressive high frequency limiting. I'm just like, just kind of tapping it and smoothing it out on the top a little bit. Dig it. All right. Um, how about um, any, uh, let, let, let's skip past tools here for just a sec. Since we already talked a lot about that, let's go to anything that you'd like to share about, you know, resource or advice for the business side of operating a studio and kind of running things, what, what advice would you like to give the rock stars? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important, you know, if you're, if you're doing this for a living, if it's your business to stay organized. So, you know, some of the tools we use, I mean, we're, we're big G suite enterprise users. I switched over to the, I, you know, went over to the dark side and started using the entire, you know, corporate Google Gmail, um, you know, we use G drive for everything and that's been great. Uh, what what I know it's probably been a while since you yeah. did this, but what do you remember? You know, if we're used to using 
the free version of Gmail, what what might be a surprising benefit to us of switching over to the actual paid G Suite version? Well, being able to use like your own domain uh, email. So instead of having a Gmail, have, you know, I'm, you know, Pete at Infrasonic Sound. Um, and we have multiple, you know, multiple email addresses and the the power to be able to forward certain email addresses uh, to, you know, a general mailbox and taking advantage of all the other tools, the doc, you know, the Google Docs and everything. So, so with great. respect to um, email and at the risk of digging too deep into the tech, if I have a hosted website and I've set up my own email through that, that's then forwarding to Gmail for me to see my email. If I was to use something like a G Suite, yeah, would would I skip that sort of circuitous path to get there? And G Suite itself would would um, create and send and receive the email directly. Yeah, you can with set, the domain name. So maybe it's even quicker. Yeah, that's exactly what I did, and you can set it up to do. Because I think yeah. mine now, like you know, if somebody sends me an email to Lidge at recordingstudiorockstars dot com, it might take for forty five minutes to an hour for my Google, you know, my Gmail to like pull that email oh, and yeah, show it to right. me. No, no. So you yeah. get instantaneous. Oh yeah. That's sure. worth it right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally, totally worth, worth it. it. I'd, I'd I mean, the, you that. know, the other huge thing for us, um, uh, for all file transfers, we use a system, uh, uh, by a company called Citrix that does uh, most people have heard of Citrix cause they do go to my PC and, you know, some other kind of popular, um, uh, software that's been around for a long time, but we use a, we use a, this, um, this, we, we use a, a, a resource called share file, which is basically a, it's, it's basically a glorified FTP replacement, mm -hmm. but it's great because you can, it's really, it's, you can archive masters. You can send people links to files and masters that are password protected that have down uh, download limits on them, um, and you know the version we have is un has unlimited bandwidth. So I use it I use it to back stuff up, and it's it's really great if I'm on the road and I have a client that you know can you resend the DDP from six months ago? I can do it from my phone. It's super. And what's secure. that one called? It's called uh, ShareFile. ShareFile and Citrix. I think is it. Did they do the go to webinars and go to yep, meetings they do all and all that. that kind of stuff? And it's and you can brand the whole thing. Uh, you can you can do all of your own branding. So you know, I know a lot of people use WeTransfer and things right, like that. Right. But you know, it's. I mean, it sucks to send a client a WeTransfer link and they've got to sit through some obnoxious ad while they download your thing. Right, totally. Or no, what happens is usually they don't download it for eight days. And then it expires. And then yeah. it expires. And then yeah. now and you're both in trouble. That that drives me nuts. So, um, you know, okay, that, cool. that's Where been the biggest go? thing for us is just being able to keep on top of our fi file organization. And then we, you know, we have uh, on-site raid backups. Uh, the yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Can, can you break that down just a little bit? Um, so we may have heard the term raid, but what does it mean if we want to have um, smart backup of an archiving of our masters, you know, on-site? Well, there, I mean, there are a bunch of different ways to do it. I'm by no means an expert. Uh, my assistant, uh, Dan, knows more about it than I do, but, but we use a RAID system, this system, the Synology system that is just a completely standalone separate network unit. So I don't automate my backups. I prefer to just manually initiate them every night. Although there, there are a million different backup software, um, solutions you can use. We're, we're PC-based for the most part, okay. uh, cause we're freak mastering engineers. Most of us are on PCs. Uh, so I just initiate my, I have a backup system that only back, it, it just backs up any new files, uh, to, to that system. And then I back them up to a separate drive as well. So, so they a, get backed up in three places. A RAID system is like a system that looks like one hard drive, but really it's a whole bunch of hard drives. Yeah. And so it's backing up redundantly in case there's a hardware failure right. in that unit. Okay, cool. Yeah. Dig it. Awesome. So, so that's been, you know, that's been great. And then again, we back up to uh, the share file system. So we use that for backups, but we also use that for, that's like kind of our client portal for, for accessing files. Okay. And, and um, if, if we're picturing this and imagining our own studio, 
do we picture um, shelves with like, you know, archive drives from 10 years ago, you know, living on our shelves as well and that sort of thing? Is that still sort of a part of the approach? Yeah. Um, and I, I'm by no means an expert on hard drives, but yeah, I mean, you know, I still have boxes and boxes filled with hard drives, yeah. uh, but they're all backed up in multiple places. Spaces. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't trust a hard drive from six years ago to even spin if it hasn't, you know, I, I, I think you're supposed to kind well. of plug them in and spin them every Yeah. That's what I was going to say is, yeah. um, you know, a reminder to us that sometimes you just need to go to the old drives and just turn them on, let them spin up and back down because they have lubrication in the bearings yeah. and things like that, that need to It's keep scary working. when they don't. <laughs> it's yeah. scary when they don't. Yeah. yeah. Although sometimes I'm like, you know, like, you know, I thought about this the other day. I was like, do I really want to keep all those records forever? It's like, they're, yeah, they're, they're on there somewhere online. By the time you get, when you get rid of it, though, you'll get a call a month later yeah. and someone needs something for something, you know? Yeah. I, I've just realized hard drive space is so cheap that I just archive everything. Yeah, that's what I do, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so now, um, great. So let's go to the last question. Uh, this one's hypothetical, but we're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. You're going to go back and find young Pete tuning up his bass that hasn't been set up, so the high um, yeah. B flat yeah. is <laughs> is not as sharp all the time. And uh, you're going to give yourself this one bit of advice. You say, Pete, listen, this is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself? I mean, I, w I would say, you know... If I was giving myself engineering advice, listen listen to the client, you know? I mean, our job is to figure out how to achieve the client's vision. That's the most important, important part of what we do. And I think in this day and age, a lot of younger engineers get caught up in wanting to be producers or wanting to put their stamp on everything. And I think especially when you're starting out, you know, your job is to capture the best performance and to do whatever it takes to, you know, facilitate, like I said, facilitate that, that, that artist's vision. That's the most important thing. So what you need to do, whatever they need you to do to, to get the, the best sounding take. So if they, you know, if they want to, sit in a specific chair, even though you insist that they stand or whatever, you need to figure out a way to work around them. You know, I mean, if you're miking up a drum set and the guy wants his Tom in a specific place and, you know, you don't argue with him that you can't get a mic in there, you figure out how to do it. Uh, yeah. You need to make the artist comfortable. And that, that's the most important thing. I, I, I think that they're, you know, just treating people with respect and, having a good time at the same time, you know, people want to work with people they like. And when they like you, they're more comfortable. And when they're more comfortable, they perform better. And I was thinking about your description of working with Vance Powell. Um, and I guess it was Dave Cobb as well. Um, but the, you know, the, the process of like the Chris Stapleton record where it was, it was there and you mostly just had to get out of the way. It didn't start out that way. Like you spent years, listening to those guys. You probably spent years listening and, and getting to know and understand um, by paying attention to the artists and the producers and the mixers and everything to get to the point where it was, it felt very transparent. Well, yeah. I mean, the hardest thing to do is nothing. And I think that, that, you know, whether you're a newer master, new, newer engineer getting into mastering or tracking, like your first example, you know, the, your first inclination is like, oh, what gear do we have in the studio? Like, I'm doing a vocal take. I need to use these four EQs and daisy chain two compressors and uh, run all this stuff in parallel. It's like, well, maybe you should just plug a 57 into a mic pre and record the vocal. Sometimes that's the the best way. Yeah. You know? Take the, you know, the, the, the straightest path is usually, you know, the most efficient. Yeah, that was uh, recently talked about. One of Richard Dodd's suggestions, which was what, you know, answer to the question of what's, what's the best mic to use? And he says, the one that's closest to the performance that's Exa just about to happen. <laughs> exactly. The, the one that's the quickest to set up. Yeah. You know, and I, I definitely learned that in my, you know, when I owned a recording studio and track, you need to be able to move quickly. Yeah. If someone wants to record a tambourine. It's like, okay, well, 
Here's the here's the microphone that was on the floor, Tom. This is what we're using to capture this right now because they have an idea right now. Yeah, you know, or the fifty seven that was set up there for scratch vocals. Maybe that's the maybe that's what the artist wants to use to record their vocals. And don't sit there and if they if they feel better holding a mic, just because you have a twenty thousand dollar U forty seven, if they're going to feel more comfortable on your fifty five dollar beat up fifty seven or fifty eight, you know, you're sure let them use that. The performance is really what matters. Yeah, and the beauty about uh, this is like, you know, listen to the artists who are going to give you, you're going to get more directions to go in in your experience of producing, engineering, mixing by following the guidance of all these artistic suggestions. And you just need to do it a lot. You're going to get plenty of chance to try everything. Yep. Yeah. Just got to yeah. do it a lot, right? And that that's the hardest thing is just like having some self-control. Yeah, like, and that kind of goes back to my philosophy: of using the least amount of gear possible to, you know, achieve that vision. Dig it. Well, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, Pete. Totally awesome to be hanging with you and Thanks, have you Lidge. here on the show. Let the Rockstars know how they can find you guys online. They need to um, come get their next hit record done. How do they? How do they reach you? Uh, yeah, you can, I mean, you could reach us at infrasonicmastering.com. Uh, you know, we're on Facebook and Instagram and you can follow me on Instagram. It's just Plyman, P-L-Y-M-A-N. Nice. Uh, and again, that's infrasonic, like, like infrared, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, it's mostly pictures of my kid and motorcycles, but you know. Those are cool things. Okay, occasional, uh, occasional audio tidbits. Dig it. Well, um, thank you again for being here. Rockstar is a reminder that we will include links to what we're talking about in the show notes. Just click through on your mobile device or go to rsrockstars.com, magnifying glass, search for Pete Lyman, and uh, there will you'll also find a YouTube playlist of some of Pete's great records. Um, and thanks so much for listening. It's a pleasure as always. Uh, also, Rockstars, are just a quick reminder, if you are at the point of um, just getting into this and you're digging into mixing, I do have a free course at mixmasterbundle.com where you get to download multi-tracks of my, my instrumental record. And I show you how I mix them with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, but it will work for you in any DAW. So go check that out. And we'll see you guys uh, in the next episode. Thank, thanks so much, for Pete. For thanks, Lidge. All right, dude. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. <laughs>